research paper to a special issue of the Journal of Insect Behavior, we encourage you to contact myself, Sigrid, or Andres. <coughs> um, a special note, we, we, need, we owe a, a debt of gratitude to these three people. Um, the webinar series would not be possible without their efforts. Uh, Dr. Tuan Duong um, from the Forestry and Agrobiotechnology Institute at the University of Pretoria has been instrumental in getting the platform and the registration up and running. Uh, Quentin is uh, shown in the middle as a PhD student at Fabi, and he runs the IT side of things. And Josephine, you've already met, uh, is moderating this session. And a special thanks to the Forestry and Agro Biotechn Agricultural Biotechnology Institute at the University of Pretoria for hosting the webinar series. It gives me great pleasure to introduce today's symposium coordinator, Dr. Almuth Hammerbacher. Almuth started her academic training at the University of Pretoria, received her PhD in Germany, uh, spent five years post PhD working at the Max Planck Institute, the last four of which as a research group leader in the Department of Biochemistry. In 2016, she returned home and joined the faculty at the University of Pretoria in the Forestry and Agro Bio Agricultural Biotechnology Institute where she has quickly established uh, a large research program and is emerging as a leader in the fields of chemically mediated interactions in, between plants, insects, and microbes. Okay, Quentin, I'll stop sharing and maybe you can queue up. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where in the world you are. I would like to thank the organizers of this seminar series for inviting us to showcase our research on chemically mediated plant herbivore microbe interactions in forests. The two tree species that we will be dealing with today are the Norway spruce tree and the black poplar. These two species are occasionally attacked by the bark beetle Ips typographus or the gypsy moth caterpillar respectively. In the case of the bark beetle, it inoculates the tree with one or more associated blue stain fungi during its attack, which then discolor the bark and the wood of the host. Poplar is infected with the rust fungus Melanzora laricea populina on an annual basis causing a severe leaf disease. Because this disease is recurring every summer, the chances are quite high that the gypsy moth caterpillars will encounter this disease when feeding on poplar. My two colleagues will focus in their presentation specifically on these interactions. For this reason, in order to put their work into the bigger context, I will try to quickly introduce the direct chemical interactions of these insects and fungi with their respective host trees. Norway spruce trees are well known to produce terpenoid oleoresin and polyphenols in response to attack by bark beetles and the associated fungi. These defense mechanisms are very robust under abiotic stress and a recent study by Jianbai Wang illustrated this quite elegantly. Jianbai simulated drought stress in his experiments by growing plants under limited amounts of carbon dioxide. The rationale of simulating drought by reducing the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in which the plants were growing is that plants close their stomata under drought stress and are therefore not able to optimally assimilate carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Under progressive carbon limitation, Jambai showed that carbon assimilation is proportionally reduced. Starch biosynthesis and respiration also decreases rapidly under carbon limitation. However, under mild carbon starvation, the plant still invests the limited carbon it can get into growth and the biosynthesis of secondary metabolites. 
Interestingly, we find that even under severe carbon limitation, the plant still invests as much as it can into the production of the defenses, oleoresin and phenolics. This shows very clearly how robust the defense metabolism of these trees is. Now the question arises, how do beetles and their associated fungi overcome the formidable defenses of the host? Originally, it was proposed that bark beetle associated fungi stimulate the tree's defenses and thereby exhaust the tree's reserves. However, this argument was not unanimously accepted by the community and it was proposed that bark beetle mass attacks alone are sufficient to overcome a host tree's defenses. These authors propose that fungi are likely commensal or might even compete with the beetles for resources in the phloem. A third way of thinking about this has recently emerged where we propose that mass attacks are important for adult beetles in overcoming host defenses, but that the fungi are important for increasing the fitness of the offspring of the attacking bark beetles by detoxifying their defenses in the phloem. That bark beetle associated fungi degrade phenolic compounds has been shown quite convincingly over the last few years. I have selected catechin, which is a subunit of condensed tannins, as an example. This phenolic compound is abundant in spruce phloem. When incubating two bark beetle associated fungi, B and AB, in artificial medium containing catechin, we find a significant decrease of this compound after 12 hours. The functus makes lactones from the catechin using two different reaction mechanisms. These intermediary compounds are then further metabolized as an energy source. To answer the question of how relevant this is to the bark beetle, we did a choice experiment where we offered a group of beetles medium containing catechin and medium without and observed that all beetles that made a choice chose the medium without additional catechin. We then set up another bioassay where we inoculated a fungus on the medium containing catechin. Interestingly, the beetles now chose the medium with catechin on which the fungus was growing. In this way, we could show that one important role of bark beetle associated fungi is the detoxification of host defense compounds. When looking more deeply into the system, one finds that these beetle associated fungi fulfill many more roles than just detoxifying host defense compounds. And this is where I would like to introduce Dr. Dinesh Kumar Kanasami, who has devoted more or less 10 years to finding out what the roles of bark beetle associated fungi are in this system. Dinesh obtained his PhD in biochemistry in 2019 and due to the fact that he has a really rare skill set, he was invited to stay on at the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology in Jena for a postdoctoral fellowship. Next year Dinesh will be moving to Martin Andersen's lab in Lund to further investigate the interactions of bark beetles with the associated fungi on a population level. Apart from his research, Dinesh maintains a bark beetle lab colony. The outstanding traits of Dinesh is the, his deep understanding of the system through observation, his patience with his little beetle friends, and his creativity of designing new experimental systems for studying bark beetles. Some of his simple and elegant bioassay setups are now used throughout the world by collaborators and competitors alike. The second experimental system that we will be looking at today is the black poplar tree and its interactions with the poplar rust fungus and the gypsy moth. In contrast to the spruce bark beetle system, the chemical responses of the host differ somewhat depending on the attacking species. In response to fungal infection, the tree will emit moderate levels of volatiles. 
I am showing the homoterpene dimethyl nonatriene as an example, but the trend is similar for other sesquiterpenes and green leaf volatiles. Phenolics, especially condensed tannins and its subunit catechin, increase quite dramatically in poplar leaves upon rust infection. Interestingly, by staining leaves from different commercial varieties for tannins, we could show that the amount of catechin and condensed tannins in a poplar leaf correlates to its resistance to the rust fungus. For the tree's responses to herbivory, I am relying quite heavily on data published by Dr. Sibylle Unzika and her group. She established Poplar as an experimental system at the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology in Jena and is definitely the conceptual driving force behind most of the research on Poplar conducted at this institute. Sibylle and her group showed that Poplar emits high levels of volatiles from a number of different chemical classes in response to herbivory. She also showed that some of these volatiles are very important in attracting natural enemies of the gypsy moth caterpillar. Poplar produces also a specific class of phenolic compound known as the salicinoids. Although these compounds are only produced constitutively and are not induced by caterpillar feeding, they are strong feeding deterrents. Due to the somewhat contrasting poplar responses to herbivory and pathogen infection, we wanted to find out what the ecological consequences would be under simultaneous herbivory and pathogen infection, as this happens quite frequently in nature. Interestingly, simultaneous attack elicits a smaller response in volatile emissions than herbivory on its own, which might have far-reaching consequences for the third trophic level. We then did a choice experiment where we offered the caterpillar the choice between a healthy tree and an infected tree and we were really surprised to see that the caterpillar chose the rust infected trees over the healthy trees. Why gypsy moth caterpillars make this choice will be the topic of the second talk today which will be given by Dr. Franziska Eberl. Francisca obtained her PhD in 2019, followed by a short postdoctoral stint at the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology, working on protease inhibitors. The Max Planck Institute has its own workshop for designing and making experimental equipment. Because Francie is very practical with lots of experience in designing her own equipment, as can be seen on the right, she has been appointed as the communications officer to help with the conversion of high-flown scientific ideas into useful pieces of equipment and to do some work on optimizing certain pieces of equipment. She also holds an appointment at the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena as a project coordinator for the life sciences. I thank you for your attention and I hope that you will enjoy the talks that will be given today by my two colleagues. Thank you. Hello everyone. Uh, so Almut will be available for questions during the discussion period at the end of the seminar. Uh, but now we'll, we'll jump right in with uh, Janish uh, talk. Hello everyone. Thank you, Almut, uh, for your kind introduction. Before I start, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for giving me this chance to present my work. Today, I'm going to talk about how conifer tree turpins mediate interactions between conifer bark beetles and their fungal symbionts. Turpins represent the characteristic defense chemistry of conifers. Conifer turpins are exclusively made up of monoterpins, sesquiterpins, and diterpin acids. Monoterpins and diterpin acids contribute to the majority of terpins in conifers, whereas sesquiterpins are present only in trace amounts. Terpins are produced and stored in specialized structures called resin ducts. Constitutively, upon tissue damage, the resins that are stored under high pressure are released to fend off herbivores and pathogens. 
the synthesis of terpenes can also be induced upon on abiotic and biotic stresses which result in high variation in both the concentration and composition of these chemicals. Terpenes containing resins are a primary defense in conifers. Uh, terpenes also act as a general defense against many herbivores and pathogens. Uh, they act as a physical barrier for burrowing insects such as bark beetles. Uh, pitch tubes containing sticky resin uh, as seen in the, in the left hand side picture are immediately formed around the wounded site which stops the movement of uh, herbivores by paralyzing them. Terpenes also act as a feeding deterrent and can also repel uh, insects from the host tree that produces it. Uh, terpene va vapors also act as a neurotoxin which result in immediate death of insects. Terpenes can also inhibit the microbial growth uh, as seen in the right hand side picture. Resin droplets are formed at the leading edge of the mycelium which inhibit the, uh, the growth of microbes. The spruce forest in Europe are dying at an unexpected rate in the last few years. The reason for this massive die-off is due to a tiny bark beetle called Ips typographus, which is native to Europe. Ips typographus, like many other bark beetles, feeds on the nutritious phloem tissues underneath the bark and complete their whole life cycle in the same tissue. When the beetle population is low, bark beetles usually prefer old and stressed trees and, in, and it helps to maintain the uh, health and age of the forest. In the last few years, Bark beetles have become a serious problem, uh, mainly due to global warming, which result in a prolonged drought and built, uh, mild winter. These environmental conditions uh, favor the growth of the beetle population. When the beetle population is high, when it reaches above a th certain threshold, uh, bark beetle not only attacks stress trees, but also healthy trees, which result in huge ecological and economic loss. Bark beetles feed on phloem tissues, rich in defense chemicals such as terpenes and phenolics. The interesting question is how do bark beetles circumvent these host defenses? Beetles have found two ways to overcome the host tree defense. First by mass attack, meaning that a single tree is attacked in thousands in short interval of time using aggregation pheromone. The host tree monoterpene alpha pinis, pinin is oxidized by beetle enzymes to produce cis urbanol, which is a beetle pheromone that ag signals conspecific beetles to aggregate beetles on a single host tree. In this way, bark beetle over, overwhelm the tree defenses. The other way is to partner with uh, symbiotic microbes such as fungi. Uh, bark beetle associated fungi may have multiple role in the life cycle of bark beetles. Fungi can also help beetles to overwhelm the tree defense by depleting the tree reserves that are necessary to produce these defense chemicals. Fungi may also improve the fitness of offspring by detoxifying host tree defenses and also by supplying essential uh, nutrients such as vitamins and sterols. In return, bark, beetle, bark beetles usually vectors these fungi to new host trees. Bark beetles are associated with multiple fungal symbionts. They are also known as blue stain fungi as these fungi cause uh, bluish color in the infested phloem and the sapwood. Uh, these are free living ascomycid uh, belonging to different taxa. Out of multiple uh, symbionts, the following species are considered as most dominant and frequent symbionts. They are Endogondia fora polonica, Grossmania pensilata, Grossmania erosioides, and Ophiostoma bee collar. These fungi are suggested to be important for successful invasion of bark beetles and also for the fitness of the offspring. In early spring, adult beetles disperse uh, uh, to find a suitable host tree. Males are the pioneer six, which identify a suitable tree and it constructs beating chamber underneath the bark and release aggregation from bone composed of cis verbanol derived from the host tree, alpha pinin and, and adeno produced 2 methyl 3 butan 2 all The conspecific beetles respond to aggregation pheromone signal and attack tree in high densities in short time. Once the tree defense is exhausted, 1 to 4 females join with a single male and each female constructs its own uh, ovipushion chamber and it lay eggs along the sides of the wall and inoculates it with the symbiotic fungi. A each female can lay up to 18 eggs in their ovipushion chamber. The blue color here represents the growth of the fungus. The larvae that hatch from the eggs, they make their own feeding tunnels away from the egg gallery uh, and grow together with the fungus. The larvae gets its nutrition by feeding on, on the phloem tissues conditioned by the fungi. Uh, after metamorphosis, the so-called immature adults 
feed intensively on fungi until it gains enough energy to fly to a new host tree. Unlike some Ambrosia beetles and few other bark beetles, Apes typographus does not contain glandular mycangia, a specialized organ to harvest and transport spores. Whether beetles with or without mycetangia, uh, it is not clear what maintains the association between beetles and fungi. Therefore, in this talk, first I will talk about how bark beetles maintain their symbiosis with their fungal symbionts. In the later part of the talk, I will talk about um, how host tree monotype paints maintain interactions between bark beetles and their fungal symbionts. We thought that the volatiles emitted by fungi act as set of technician cues for bark beetles. Uh, in order to test this hypothesis, I designed a novel olfactometer made up of circular petri dish containing two traps that are facing opposite to each other. Holes were made on the sides so that the beetles can enter inside. Uh, Fungus-free agar plugs were placed in the control traps and agar plugs containing a single fungus were placed in the treatment traps. The beetles and the agar plugs were not in direct contact. In order to reach the contents inside the traps, beetles have to uh, follow through the volatiles, primarily through olfaction. The bar chart shows the choice of the beetles either towards a fungus-free uh, um, agar plugs or uh, to the agar plugs containing different fungi. The volatiles from three uh, fungi such as E. polonica, Grossmannia pensilata and Grossmannia europhioides were highly attractive, but the volatiles from two of your stomach uh, species were not attractive. Next, I analyzed volatiles from, from, uh, from all these fungi grown on potato dextrose agar. Alcohols and esters clearly dominated the volatile profile of all these fungi. Uh, all fungi produced aliphatic alcohols uh, such as 3-methyl-1-butanol and 2-methyl-1-butanol uh, with some variations among uh, different species whereas the corresponding ester, 3-methyl-1-butyl uh, acetate which has the strong smell of ripe banana is produced only by the most attractive fungi E. polonica and Grossmannia pensilata. Likewise, 2-phenyl-ethanol which, which has a strong flavor of rose is produced by all fungi and the corresponding ester 2-phenyl ethyl acetate is produced only by, by the most attractive fungi, uh, uh, E. polonica and Grossmannia pensilata. So using trap uh, biosis, we showed for the first time that uh, bark beetles select fungi based on their volatile profile and the volatiles mediate interactions between bark beetles and fungi. However, not all fungi are attractive to bark beetles. The species that emits higher amounts of aliphatic and aromatic esters are generally more attractive. In reality, bark beetle associated fungi colonize complex substrates such as phloem of the bark that contains terpenes, phenolics, and other nutrients. So, I tested the behavior of beetles to fungi grown on spruce bark agar. The volatile profile of, of three uh, fungi such as E. polonica, Grossmannia europhioides, and Grossmannia pensilata are very attractive. Uh, but not the volatile profile of obvious B. collar. Interestingly, uh, beetles were replied by the volatiles produced by the saprobiotic fungi of Eustoma pisi. Next, I tested the behavior of beetles to the major symbiotic fungus, Grossmannia pensilata, uh, grown on two different substrates. Uh, interestingly, majority of the beetles prefer Grossmannia pensilata volatiles when they grown on, on, on its natural substrate spruce bark agar. With these results, we came to a conclusion that adult beetles prefer fungal volatiles originating from the spruce bark uh, when challenged against the same fungus grown on artificial agar. This indicates that the volatile profile of the fungus is different in their natural substrate. The volatile profiles of spruce bark colonized by different fungi were analyzed uh, by placing a piece of bark in a glass bottle and inoculated with spores of different fungi. Uh, the headspace volatiles were um, were trapped in an absorption filter using push system uh, and the trapped volatiles were diluted using a, a suitable solvent and analyzed in gas chromatography coupled to flame ionization detector and mass spectrometry. In total, 75 compounds were identified uh, which includes host tree monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes. Uh, 
we also identify typical fungal uh, fungal volatiles such as aliphatic and aromatic alcohols and its esters in addition to this uh, we found several oxygenated monoterpenes volatile phenolics and spiroketals uh, principal component analysis clearly shows that the volatile profile of five fungi are unique the volatile profile of of ep uh, infected bark and the control bark are more or less similar. Uh, however, volatile profile of two Grossmania species and two of Eustema species are clearly different from E. polonica and uninfected bark. Uh, the volatile profile of Grossmania species and of Eustema species in return they are different from each other. In the next step, we wanted to estimate the changes in the volatile profile of the, of the bark colonies by uh, by fungus over time. For this, uh, we analyze volatile, uh, volatiles from the same bark over different time series using uh, PDMS tubes that were placed inside the glass bottle. These tubes were later analyzed using GCTD TDUMS for compound identification. Uh, the fungal infection uh, resulted in gradual increase in oxygenated monoterpenes compared to control bark. The top panel shows the, the time series volatile profile of fungus free bark and the bottom panel shows uh, the time series of grossmonia pencilata inoculated bark uh, initially monoterpenes uh, dominated the volatile profile of bark uh, gradually already after uh, 12 days oxygenated monoterpenes clearly dominated the volatile profile of the fungus uh, infected bark at the same time period in the control bark, monoterpenes still dominated the volatile profile with slight increase in oxygenated monoterpenes compared to earlier time points. Still associated fungi oxidize host monoterpenes into oxygenated monoterpenes. Each bars in this graph represent total monoterpene emission rate in, in the y-axis in response to different fungal treatment in, um, in, in, in the x-axis. Uh, Individual monoterpenes are represented in different colors in stack bars. Uh, the control bark without fungus emitted low amounts of monoterpenes, and the presence of uh, different fungi slightly stimulated the emission of total monoterpenes with no clear uh, change in the composition of individual monoterpenes. On the other hand, we found a dramatic increase in oxygenated monoterpenes only in the presence of fungi. The only exception here is E. polonica infected bark whose oxygenated monoterpene profile is not significantly different from the control. Uh, the pink uh, numbers next to uh, stack bars uh, indicate the compounds that are significantly upregulated or increased in, 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 in fungal treatments compared to the controlled bark. To identify uh, the precursors for this large variety of oxygenated monoterpenes, we grew uh, fungus in, in, in an artificial medium together with individual monoterpenes and the headspace volatiles were uh, adsorbed using PDMS tubes. Out of all individual monoterpenes tested, we found that the majority of oxygenated monoterpenes are produced from the biotransformation of three uh, host monoterpenes such as alpha pinene, beta pinene, and bonyl acetate. Uh, metabolism of alpha and beta pinene by fungus produced uh, eight different compounds in, in, in different ratios. Uh, terpenine for all, was the, was the dominant compound produced by the fungus in the presence of alpha and beta pinene and the minor compounds were isopinocamphone and transfortugenol. The bark beetle anti-aggregation pheromone verbenone is produced by the fungus only by only in the presence of alpha pinene. On the other hand, camphor which was the dominant oxygenated monoterpene found in the fungus infected bark is produced by the fungus using boronyl acetate as, as the precursor. The minor compounds were were uh, borneal here. From a detailed chemical analysis, we found that the volatile profiles of different fungi grown on spruce bark are different. Uh, oxygenated monoterpenes dominated the volatile profile of fungus infected bark, and fungi are the main source of oxygenated monoterpenes. To identify which of these fungal biotransformation products are biologically relevant to bark beetles, uh, we conducted single sensorium recording to identify and locate olfactory sensory neurons that detect mainly oxygenated monoterpenes. Olfactory sensilla, or the, these tiny hallux structures, uh, as you see in this picture, uh, are the sensor organs of the insects present mostly in, on the antenna lobe uh, in bark beetles. 
each sensorium process two to three olfactory neurons which express olfactory receptors in their dendrites binding of volatiles uh, with olfactory receptors sends this chemical information in the form of electric signal to higher brain centers which may induce behavior response in the beetles in single sensorium recording an electrode is inserted at the base of the sensorium and the neuron impulse is measured in response to stimulus orders delivered over antenna after screening hundreds of sensilla with a diverse order panel containing 87 compounds uh, we found two OSN types that specifically detect fungal uh, bio biotransformation products of terpenes um, we further characterized one uh, olfactory neuron type that, that mainly detects uh, monoterpene ketones such as isopenocamphone and camphor. The response spectra of this neuron clearly shows that plus isopenocamphone produced by the fungus is the primary ligand followed by other monoterpene ketones such as uh, pinocamphone um, and camphor. Interestingly, this neuron did not respond to monoterpene hydrocompounds that are the precursors of these compounds. We also found another uh, OSN type that specifically detects fungus produced monoterpene alcohols such as transfortugenol and terpenin 4 all. Uh, this neuron was also further characterized and we found that transfortugenol was the primary ligand as this compound elicited strongest response. This neuron also responded strongly to fungus produced compounds, fungus produced C8 alcohols such as 3 octanol and 1 octan 3 all, which are produced de novo. With the knowledge of olfactory active oxygenated monoterpenes in hand, I then performed trap bioassays using synthetic oxygenated monoterpenes that were diluted in series in paraffin oil and tested for their behavioral activity against adult beetles. Um, these compounds were applied on the top of filter paper in, in the presence of spruce bark agar background. Out of all olfactory active oxygenated monoterpenes tested, only transfortugenol and camphor were behaviorally active as a single compound. And both these compounds were attractive at a specific dose of 100 microgram, while uh, a high dose of most oxygenated monoterpenes are inhibitory to adult bark beetles. Using single sensorium recordings, we proved that beetles can perceive these fungus produced oxygenated monoterpenes and, and through specialized olfactory sensory neurons, and some of these compounds especially transfortugenol and camphor are, be are behaviorally active as a single compound. Lastly, I checked the role of fungal volatiles in pheromone-mediated communication in males and females. Synthetic aggregation pheromones were diluted in paraffin oil and, and, and they were tested either alone or as a mix containing 50 to 1 ratio of 2-methyl-3-butan-2-ol and cis um, Only females are strongly attracted to individual pheromones and their mix at a specific dose. Uh, interestingly, males were unresponsive to, to both um, individual pheromones and, and their mix. When we give a choice between pheromone mix in the absence of fungal volatiles and the pheromone mix in the presence of, of Grossmannia pensilata uh, background volatiles, surprisingly, majority of females prefer pheromone mix together with fungal volatiles. Uh, these results and this result is actually very exciting and it suggests a possible role of fungal volatiles also during aggregation of beetles especially for females. From trap biosis using aggregation pheromones and fungal volatiles we found that adult, adult uh, females prefer a combination of pheromones together with fungal volatiles. In addition to male produced uh, aggregation pheromones we found that the females can also use fungus produced volatiles to locate a uh, suitable breeding site, possibly to identify a beneficial symbiont or to locate trees whose defense, uh, whose host defense is overwhelmed. With this, I would like to thank people uh, who helped me with this uh, project. Special thanks to Jonathan uh, for his continuous support and Almuth for her great uh, supervision and Martin for supervising uh, um, single sensorium uh, recordings work. Uh, I would like to thank Max Planck Society for funding my work and Thuringian Forest for supplying trees to breed bark beetles in laboratory and Lund University for hosting me briefly during my PhD studies. Um, I would like to thank organizers uh, again for giving me an, an opportunity to present my work and you all for your attention and thank you. Thank you Dinesh for the questions.
Um, so we have a question from Andres. Uh, so can it be concluded that the anti-aggregation pheromone is just produced by the fungus? Um, uh, yeah, not only by fungus, I think uh, endosymbionts such as bacteria can also produce bacteria. So yes, yeah, I think the, the microbes are the major source of anti-aggregation pheromone such as verbenone. Uh, yeah, uh, beetle could produce, but it's not the major source of uh, aggregation pheromone, I guess. But so far the literature says, and also our work shows that, that most microbes can oxidize, uh, further oxidize cis and all the aggregation pheromone to anti-aggregation pheromone. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat box for now. Uh, neither are uh, hence Rose. Uh, so uh, we can move on to the next talk if we don't have further questions. But if anyone has questions for Dinesh, you're welcome to post them in the chat box and I'll bring them back later for the, during the discussion. Welcome everybody. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the seminar series for organizing all this. And it's really great uh, being here. Thanks also to Almut for the nice introduction and for the invitation at the first place to give this talk here today. So this story will focus on tripartite interactions in poplar trees, which I have been studying to my, during my PhD thesis. And today I want to talk about more the herbivore side, the insect side, and why they feed on plant pathogenic fungi. So trees have numerous interaction partners under natural conditions. So we find pollinators or mycorrhizal uh, fungi, which have certainly quite positive effects on trees, but we also find negative interaction partners such as herbivores like deers but also insect herbivores or pathogens and viruses that harm the plant. Nevertheless, this is the natural situation. The situation in the lab and in many studies is that people focus on single interactions. So I was interested on what's happening actually with both fungi and insects at the same time at a tree and how these guys are interacting with each other. So as I said, I want to focus on pathogenic microbes today and one specific insect herbivore. So if we have two interaction partners at the host tree at, uh, together or after another, they could interact with each other in different ways. There could be an indirect or plant-mediated interaction, which means that one of the interaction partners changes the host tree, its chemistry or its physiology, in a way that it affects the other interaction partners. This could happen when they are there at the same time, but also with a temporal or spatial distance. However, there's also a direct interaction possible in which the both interaction partners have to be there at the same time and at the same place to really come into direct contact with each other. And this is exactly the situation that we want to focus on today. But first of all, I would like to introduce our study system. Black poplar is the host tree that uh, we use in our studies. This is a European species and grows in floodplain forests. On the picture below, you can see a natural black poplar population at Küstring Kietz which is a small island at the border between Germany and Poland. And this is also our field site and trees where we get our genetic material from for our lab cultures. Black poplar and especially its hybrids are quite relevant economically as they're grown in big plantations for biofuel or pulp production. And the natural populations of black poplar also have a certain ecological importance as there are a really a huge amount of insect species. As a model species for woody plants, black poplar is um, quite handy, you can say, because it's relatively fast growing and it's quite easy to uh, propagate it via stem cuttings. 
And interestingly, the genome of a close relative, Populus trichocarpa, has been published a couple of years ago, so that we also have this kind of genomic resource that we can mine. Further on, the second player in this round here will be the poplar rust fungus, Malamsa radlerica popolina. This is a biotrophic leaf pathogen, so that means it does not aim to kill its host, but it's depriving nutrients constantly from the host tree. It is very widespread in forests as well as plantations, and you kind of can find it basically everywhere where you can find the host tree. Interestingly, this fungus has a macrocyclic and a vegetative or microcyclic life cycle. So macrocyclically means this is the cycle over the whole year and it requires populus and larix, as the name might suggest, as two different host trees. However, on populus, it can make a small, only one week long cycle to reproduce itself again and again on the same tree species. So, and just to shortly go through that kind of cycle, so it takes only a few hours until the stoma penetrates the leaf epidermis. And after one day, they form so-called haustoria, which I will talk about in a second. And after about seven days, you see the sporangia, the spore chambers kind of breaking through the epidermis, and then the whole cycle starts again. The second leaf pathogen I will talk about today is the powdery mildew, uh, which is as well a biotrophic leaf pathogen, but has a much broader host range than the rust fungus. So it affects a lot of the trees, especially uh, an oak. You find it a lot also in the natural conditions. Um, in contrast to the rust fungus, this fungus here is growing um, an external mycelium. So if we see it on the scheme on the right side, um, it's superficially growing, but also makes these haustoria, which are structures that you see below on the lower picture as a scheme. So it's kind of going into the cell of the plant. And this is a structure where the fungus gets the nutrients uh, amino acids, sugars, all of that kind. What is interesting here is this guy here that's called mannitol. Mannitol is a sugar alcohol and will play a quite important role later. The last player is the gypsy moth. This is the model herbivore in my studies, the Mantria disper. This is also a European species and it's a very generalist feeder. It can was reported to uh, feed on more than 40 different plant families, but it prefers deciduous trees such as poplar, oak, willow, beech, um, a lot of different species. And this species also can occur in massive outbreaks. So for example, the picture on the right side was taken in Bavaria in Germany a couple of years ago during such a gypsy moth outbreak. And this is not winter period, this is really in the summer, so it completely defoliated the whole forest. So to come to the study, what we have seen before was that the caterpillars show an attracted behavior towards the smell of infected trees and also the sporangia themselves. So how actually about the leaves itself? So this was the first thing we tested. For this, we took healthy and rust infected leaves and cut out leaf discs, which is such a punch, hole puncher, and placed the leaves in such an alternating manner into a petri dish and let the larvae choose what they want to feed. So the result for the leaf rust was pretty impressive. So almost all of the leaf discs that were eaten had the rust fungus on them. That was a very clear preference of the caterpillars for rust infected leaf material. But also for the powdery mildew, we saw very clear positive effect of the infection on the behavior of the caterpillars. 
But of course, this is a quite artificial setup, so therefore we also tested it in a, here in vivo preference assay. So you can see how this actually was set up. The leaves were still attached to the tree, and then we placed the cellophane back around it, wrapped it on both sides, and put a single caterpillar inside and checked the preference after. And even under these you know, more natural conditions, we could see a clear preference for rust infected leaves. What was very interesting during these uh, preference assays was to see the actual feeding behavior of the caterpillars. So they were not only feeding the leaf discs or the leaf area, which we measured in the end, but actually they started with feeding on the fungal tissues themselves. So for the rust fungus, they fed on these little sporangia, but also the mycelium was literally abraded from the top of the, of the leaves. To, to give you a bit more insight, I have brought a little video that shows you exactly that behavior. So you can see how it's actually foraging around, looking where is the next sporangia, and then when it finds one, it's really excavating the whole thing from the leaves. And if you see further on the leaf area, you see it's found already a couple of them, but the leaf matrix itself is not really touched. In order to quantify this kind of observation, we made a little experiment. And for this, I placed single leaves with spores on them and a single caterpillar into a Petri dish and observed the feeding behavior over 72 hours. And on the left side, you can see some example pictures. So uh, at the beginning of the experiment, I counted all the sporangia that were present and then observed how many of those were actually eaten over time. You see some disappearing after 30 hours. And then at the last picture, you see the actual leaf damage. So then the caterpillar started to feed on the leaf. And this is the, the result, the graph for that. So you see the consumption of the sporangia that were present in the beginning in percentage over a time frame of 72 hours. And each line represents an individual caterpillar. The little leaf shows when they actually started to feed on the leaf matrix. And what's interesting is that except for one outlier that started to feed quite readily on the leaf, that most of them ate all the sporangia they could find, 80 to 100 percent, and the just after that started to feed on the leaves. So what is in the leaves that they like it so much and what is in the spores and the milieu that they prefer to feed on the fungal tissue itself? So first of all, we tested for sugars in the healthy leaf, the infected leaves and the spores, because this is what you think in the first place, if you think of feeding preference of animals. But interestingly, the infection did not alter the sugar levels at all in the leaves, and the spores themselves almost contained non-sucrose or glucose or fructose, which are summed up for this big graph here. But instead, we found really huge amounts of mannitol, the sugar alcohol, in the leaves and even more in the spores. Interestingly, for the powdery mildew, we found quite similar patterns. So also here, the infection did not alter the sugar levels in the leaves, and the mycelium contained very low amounts of these kind of sugars, but mannitol was quite abundant in the mycelium that we scratched off from the top of the leaves. So what is this mannitol all about? Mannitol was reported for a couple of fungi to be converted from fructose, for some also from glucose, into mannitol. And Ralph Vögeler and his group uh, showed this quite nicely with uh, bean rust, how the fungus actually takes up sucrose from its host, then hydrolyzes it into glucose and fructose. The glucose is taken up by the fungus immediately, but the fructose is converted into mannitol which the fungus pumps into the apoplast of the leaf, 
which is very clever because the plants cannot use mannitol. And once the fungus needs some energy reserves, it kind of takes up the mannitol again. So it's floating around everywhere in the leaves and also in the fungal tissue itself. So what do the caterpillars say about mannitol? To find this out, we coated mannitol solution, uh, which was thickened a little bit with agar, onto a leaf surface and cut out again these leaf discs and placed them into a petri dish so that they could choose between mannitol supplemented and non-supplemented leaf discs. And this is the result. So you can see that mannitol supplemented leaf discs were eaten twice as much as non-supplemented leaf discs, which shows that mannitol actually acts as a feeding attractant or feeding stimulant for these caterpillars. So now we have learned that caterpillars feed on fungal tissues and that they prefer it because of high amounts of mannitol, but does that actually have anything to do with the performance? So what is the outcome of this preference? To figure this out, we made a little performance experiment. So for this, I caged a single caterpillar into these kind of little tubs or boxes. Um, with a single leaf and then after three days I always exchanged it against the new tree and observed the development of the caterpillars. On the right side you now see the results of this experiment. So you see the individual weight of um, the caterpillars and in the inside this is just a zoom in for the very first days. And already after three days, we can see that the group that feed on the rust-infected poplar trees gain twice as much weight as their corn specifics under control. And this pattern just continues until the pupation. Interestingly, the pupae in the end did not differ in their weight. But the time until pupation from hatching to pupation was significantly shorter for those caterpillars that fed on rust-infected leaves. So what could be the reason for this? Is this more nutritional? To figure that out, we made some chemical analysis of the plant and the fungal tissues. So first of all, we sampled tissues from the poplars and also from the rust sporangia themselves, made a methanol extraction, and then via LCMS and LCU we analyzed for certain defects compounds and nutrients. So and this is what we got. On the top row you see the content uh, in the healthy leaves, the infected leaves and the spores for specific phenolic compounds. On the left side are salicinoids. This is a group of phenolic glucosides which we find um, specifically in the salicaceae plant family. And we see that the rust infection did not significantly influence the leaf chemistry in this respect. But also we see that the spores do not accumulate at all these kind of compounds. We see only trace amounts if you compare the axis for spores and for the leaf material. Similar observation we see for flavonoids. There we could not detect at all any kinds of these compounds in the spores themselves, even though the leaf tissue that is rust infected show a significant increase, which has also been shown before that this is a typical response of poplar trees towards this biotraffic pathogen. Having a look at the nutrients that are also more interesting for the caterpillars, we could see that amino acids are highly increased in the spore material compared to leaves. And also the nitrogen content was about 50% elevated in the spores compared to leaf material. Interestingly, the 3% dry weight that we found in the spores meets exactly the intake target that was previously reported for gypsy moth. On top of all that, we could also see that the infected leaves and the fungal tissue contain high amounts of certain B vitamins. So B vitamin B3, B5 and B7 
have been shown to be twice as much as 100 times as high as in the control leaves. For mildew and mildew-infected leaves, the situation looked quite similar. I just show you here the graph for amino acids as an example, but basically all the other compounds had very similar patterns to that what we've seen with the last direction. To sum this whole talk up, um, I want to give you the last two, three take-home messages. So we have been looking at the direct effect of mildew and poplar rust fungus on caterpillars of the gypsy moth, which both occur on the host tree black poplar. First of all, we have learned that mannitol is produced in massive amounts by both of the fungi and leads to a feeding preference of the caterpillars for both the infected tissue but also the fungal tissue. Further, we have seen that the nutrient value of leaves that are infected with fungi is increased for the caterpillars, which leads to a higher performance more specifically to a shorter development time of the larval stage. The nutrients that were investigated have been amino acids, the nitrogen contents and B vitamins, which showed increased levels in the fungal tissue and low amounts of the phenolic defense compounds that are typically found in the host tree. With this, I would like to thank a couple of people. First of all, Almut and Sibylle, who have supervised me during the my PhD time, also the whole biochemistry department, the scientific workshop and the gardeners of the MPICE and the Roma lab of the BGC, um, which conducted the nitrogen analysis. I also want to thank the Max Planck um, Institute and the Max Planck Society for funding and all of you for your attention. Thank you very much, Francisca, for the talk. Uh, we have a few questions for you. So the first question is, given that the fungi are attractive to the caterpillars and may be beneficial, do you know if adults transmit spores of the fungi? So um, about adults, I didn't test adults. Um, I have to say that the uh, females do not even fly. So the female, um, cater not caterpillars, the moths, um, but if you observe the larvae, so the caterpillars, they're really heavily um, carrying the rust spores, um, in fact, because they're quite hairy. But actually, I don't think that this plays a big role because the spores transmit themselves quite easily via wind or via rain. So I don't think that this plays a really big role um, as it's also yeah, transmitted via abiotic factors. Thank you. Um, so we have a complimentary uh, comment about that question. Do you believe it would be a vertical or a mechanical transmission? For me or for Dinesh? Y yes, for you, sorry. Ah. <laughs> um, so, well, can you, can you repeat? Uh, so complementing uh, that previous question, do yeah. you believe it would be a vertical or mechanical transmission? From the fungus. Yes, I assume. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so mechanical sounds quite logic. So it's really just, it's, they're quite sticky. Um, and as soon as they land on the leaf and find good, um, good environment, they start within a few hours to build their germ tubes and then uh, the infection is already going on. Thank you. Uh, so then we have another question. Do volatiles play a role in mediating the fungal attractiveness? Uh, so, yes, uh, I think they definitely do. Um, Almut showed shortly a um, little slide on this that we saw that uh, rust infected trees are more attractive than non infected trees in terms of volatiles. And I also tested like the volatile bouquet of separated spores. And these are actually highly attractive to the caterpillars more than any single compounds. So we didn't find a single compound that um, is responsible for this attraction, but the mixture, the whole bouquet of that is definitely attracting. Thank you. 
Uh, so next, still for you. Uh, do you think that these relationships are a reason why fungal infection and gypsy moth infestation are often the main agents in complex diseases of deciduous trees? For instance, oak decline. Drought is often a triggering factor. Is fungal growth promoted by drought stress? So, um, first of all, I don't know much about oak, but I can just uh, speculate on this in Poplar. So maybe answering that from the back. Um, for drought stress, it has been shown that acute drought stress on poplar trees actually prohibits the infection of rust because they have to enter the stomata. And if the trees close their stomata because of um, as a drought response, um, it's harder for the fungus to actually get in. So in this case, maybe there's not really um, a synergistic effect, but for the caterpillars and the, um, the pathogens, in previous experiments where I focused more on the tree side, we actually could observe that a pathogen infection is reducing the ability of the tree to defend itself against herbivory. So it seems that this really weakens the defense of the tree if we have both antagonists together. Thank you. Uh, so now I will open the um, uh, discussion. And so we have uh, questions for uh, Dinesh. You presented Ips typographist nearly as a phloem mesetophagus fungus, but is this really true? My view was always that the larvae feed initially in front of the blue stain fungal invasion front. Uh, oh, yes, I think, so if you look at the gallery, when you open a, a recently um, colonized, uh, I mean, a fresh gallery, you see early instars, they mostly feed on fresh phloem tissues. You can easily identify what they are feeding by looking at their gut because it's quite visible. Uh, but if you see the late instars, right before pupation, you see their gut completely, it's, it's colored. They mostly feed on fungus or fungus infected tissues. And after metamorphosis, the adults, they, they usually do back feeding or maturation feeding. What they do is that they, after they come, after a pupation, if they don't have uh, if they don't have a right fungus in their pupil chamber, what they do is that they they go back, they feed on the older sections of the gallery, uh, especially in the areas where, where the fungus is highly, uh, I mean fungus is colonized. Yeah, so I mean these are our observations. We and and we are trying to quantify this to show that uh, also its typographers is is also uh, get nutrition by feeding on fungus. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if Amit is around uh, because we have a, a question for Amit and Dinesh. Um, it's on the decomposition of phenols by fungal associates and its role for the bark beetle blue stain fungal symbiosis. Does this not come too late when the tree is already clinically dead? Initially, within the first one or two weeks of bark beetle attack, fungal growth if in phloem and xylem is very limited and the adult beetles are, and larvae feed in fresh phloem. At least this is my view. Um, uh, Josephine, I'm here. My name is Local ADM. If okay. you could uh, start my video, then I, uh, you kind of block that. So, <clears throat> okay. so to answer this question, um, we believe that um, mostly the uh, fungus can benefit the offspring of the, um, of the bark beetles. So basically, when the, for the phenolics at least, when the eggs are laid, then the fungus starts growing and it starts detoxifying everything in those galleries. And as the offspring now um, emerges, it can survive on a very nice substrate that contains a lot less phenolics. And these phenolics, as is, it is known, are actually um, feeding inhibitors in the sense that they complex with proteins and other cell constituents and then makes them unavailable. So in this way, um, the uh, fungus actually does help bark beetle fitness, but it's more for the offspring than for the initial um, generation that colonizes the tree. Thank you. Uh, so I have another question for Dinesh. The tests were made on walking beetles in a gradient of odor. They indicate close range responses, but might not completely explain long range orientation behavior. Do you plan to replicate this test with flying beetles, either in a wind tunnel or in field experiments? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the nice question. Yes, uh, I think um, Anna in Prague, is, she's currently doing this experiment. 
she's testing individual oxygenated monoterpenes in field traps, in field conditions. But I mean, in I think so far, when so in field experiments, you always mix a certain compound of your interest together with aggregation pheromone. Uh, either you find an inhibitory response or no response. I think hardly anyone find, except there are a few studies where they showed that addition of few compounds in, actually improve the attractiveness. So, I mean, in, our studies mostly concerns what happens after beetles land on a tree. So when the beetles land on the tree, they keep on scanning. They go, especially females, they go for, they seek male uh, breeding chambers. They go from one entrance hole to another. So we also showed, yes, this, maybe these oxygenated monoterpenes produced by the fungus may have more meaning in a close range and aggregation pheromones like cis verbenol and 2-methyl-3-butyl to, to all may have a, a clear role in long range attraction. And, and yeah, so I think maybe for the flying beetles, these uh, fungus produced compound doesn't matter at all. Only when they are in the close range, yes, they might be more meaningful for them. Okay, thank you. Uh, then we have another comment uh, for Dinesh. As you know, the bark beetle associated fungi are also closely associated with mites vectored by the beetles. There are good examples where these fungi are important sources of food for the mites. It would be fascinating to see a, replica a replicate of your studies with, say, one of the key mites carried by Ipstipocryphus. I, I suspect that you would find sim similar results. Yeah, I, I, I think so too. And so, so we, we often, yeah, we always see mites together with bark beetles. And then when you put them on a petri dish, you can see mites, they, 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 reproduce much faster and they also feed on certain fungi uh, but yeah so it, it's possible so maybe some of the isos uh, the associates that we think that is bark beetle associates maybe it's not uh, maybe they are the the the, the symbionts of mites not the bark beetles itself for example of your species because it, it has been report, reported by by Rika uh, in Finland and some colleagues in Sweden that Mites usually, so when you sample certain mites associated with Ipstipographus, you mostly find Ophiostoma species. So of course, yes, maybe beetles use, have a certain uh, nutritional symbiont and mites might have certain uh, species, for example, Ophiostoma as food source. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Almut. What do the findings of Huang et al mean for mature forest trees, assuming that old trees can rely on a lot of resources. I conclude that shorter and milder drought periods will not have any effects on tree defense. At which point do you expect consequences? So <clears throat> the thing is um, what um, Jan Bai and his colleagues did was quite artificial in the sense that they only starved the tree of carbon. They did not um, include the mechanical effects of a, a drought treatment. And these mechanical effects have a quite detrimental um, function in the tree and um, the xylem vessels collapse and the whole tree physiology changes due to these mechanical damages that occur during a drought period. Um, so uh, if these mechanical damages occur, then basically the tree has to deal with two different things, the lack of water and also the mechanical wounding. And therefore, um, the response will be different. And I don't think that the tree will um, in invest so much in defense as it will invest more into growth in that case in order to, to salvage what there is to salvage. If that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, next question is for Francisca. Do you think that this behavior could be the consequence of the artific artificial conditions in which larvae look for extra nutrients? So we yeah, are talking about artificial um, conditions. Of course, we were also concerned about this because the caterpillars that we use are grown in a lab culture for several generations. And we still plan to repeat the experiment with um, gypsy moth that we found um, outside in the field. Um, but we did the same experiment with the rusty tussock moth that we found outside. So there were really freshly from 
natural conditions and they are also preferred to feed on um, the rust infected leaves compared to uninfected leaves. So I think it's more widespread also um, in nature. It just might balance their diet. Thank you. Um, now back to Dinesh. Uh, do you have any idea how the production of volatiles is in influenced or altered when several fungi are growing together? In fact, this happens in vivo in breeding systems of Ips typographers. Uh, no, we, uh, we, I mean, I, we didn't test this, but uh, we know from, from, some, from, from the associates of mountain pine beetle, uh, uh, Nadir in, in British, uh, in Alberta, University of Alberta, he showed that when you have co-cultures, uh, of course, it can influence uh, the pheromone, uh, the volatile production. The problem we have is that most of the compounds produced by all fungi, I mean, they're quite similar. So it's hard to say uh, how co-culture either increase or, 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 or decrease the production of volatiles from one fungi. So, I mean, they hardly have few uh, unique compounds. Unfortunately, those compounds are not the major ones. So uh, it's, 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 it's quite hard to test this. Thank you. Uh, then we we have another question for you. Why this big difference in produ in producing oxygenated monoterpenes between GP and EP? Is there any biological explanation? Uh, yeah, we still don't know why EP doesn't produce any of these, or E. polonica, for example, doesn't produce any of these oxygenated monoterpenes. Uh, I mean, they do grow well. I mean, if you if you if you inoculate this fungus in, in a terpene rich diet. Uh, they don't die and they grow normally. I mean, but we don't see any volatiles. Perhaps like what Al Almut suggested, they could use other biochemical pathways. Instead of producing volatiles, they could also, yeah, quite quick in, in, in utilizing these terpenes as a carbon source. Yeah, and also uh, most fungi, for example, uh, including EP or E. polonica and grossmania, when you grow them in the atmosphere of terpene vapors, uh, you can induce their growth. So it seems that that these fungi are not affected by monoterpene uh, vapors at all. Instead, they use them as a carbon source and, and, and as a byproduct, they also produce these oxygenated monoterpenes that is actually acting as a signal. It's telling something to the bark beetles. Yeah. Thank you. Um, then we have another question for Francisca. Could this be a general model of plant pathogen insect interaction? Could powdery mildews which are also obligate biotrophic parasites, also be beneficial to gypsy moth larvae. And what about necrotrophic, pathotrophic pathogens parasites? All right, so um, I didn't test the effect of mildew on the performance of gypsy moth, but I would uh, assume that, they, that this pathogen has a very similar effect and might also be beneficial for them because just the uh, nutrient content and um, the chemical composition is quite similar. And also the reaction of the plant to mildew might be quite similar as it's also a biotroph. Um, about necrotrophs, we did not test this, but I would assume that this might have uh, very different consequences. So there was a study um, on aphids where they tested biotroph and a um, necrotroph pathogen and the effect on the performance of the aphids and actually that showed very contrasting effects. Um, so the biotroph was uh, beneficial whereas a necrotrophic infection of the host had uh, negative results. And I would assume that this looks quite similar for the gypsy moth but of course this is just speculation. Thank you. Uh, I believe Jeremy has a question for you. Yeah, sorry. Um... So Franzi, you may have answered this, but my internet connection has been dropping. So I, I apologize if you did. Um, I'm curious, I don't know how mobile gypsy moth larvae are on a host tree. So have you thought, have you looked at female oviposition behavior and how that might be affected by the, the different fungi? Yes, so the females, they are not able to fly. So they basically oviposit where they have been pupating. Um, so that means that the larval stage actually is um, determining where the oviposition will take place later. And the larvae are most mobile in their early stages because they're very light. And if they don't like the host, 
they gonna um, for ballooning, so just let themselves transport via wind, and uh, yeah, look for some better ground. And so I think that this therefore has also consequent on the next generation. That might so do you think they balloon more if they're on an uninfected leaf tissue than if they are on an infected leaf tissue? I would guess that, yeah. I never tested in a field, but that would be my, my guess. Thank Thanks you. for a great talk. So Josephine, I'm not sure if there are more talks, but I just want to get in. So two weeks time, the moderator Josephine and the IT person Quentin are among the speakers. So hopefully you all can return in two weeks time to see um, uh, talks on Cyrex Noctilio Behavioral and Chemical Ecology. And the bar has been set very high by this week's webinar. It was excellent, all three of you. Um, so we have a question for Dinesh. Uh, do you have any data on glio Glioocystidium epidophilum? I recall that a few years ago I sent isolates to you. This is from Thomas, by the way. Did you include this species in any of your studies? Uh, yes, yes, Thomas. Um, uh, I didn't, yeah, I didn't show the data. Yes, uh, they do produce similar volatiles like ophiostomoid fungi, even though they are best geomycid. I mean, this is quite interesting because they all, they all produce same volatiles like uh, uh, other fungi, and then yeah, and and they are also attractive to bug beetles when you when you use them in trap biosays, and they are very nutritious to bug beetles compared to ophiostomite fungi. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I don't see more questions, um, or but. Ah, we have a question for Francisca. Transferring your data to the field, does the rest fungus already occur frequently when gypsy moth larvae occur? Yes, very good question. Um, so in fact, the gypsy moth actually occurs uh, in the first generation very early in the year. It's usually making one generation. It can do two under very good conditions. But uh, in fact, this is a quite artificial system, I have to admit. So this is why we included the um, rusty tussock moth, which is also aerobit species, and it's closely related for at least the preference assays. And yeah, there has to be a lot um, work to be done, of course, uh, also with other species. So we also don't know how widespread this phenomenon is. And yeah, it would be great to know. Uh, also for species that occur later in the year, but uh, other pathogens occur also earlier in the year. So yeah, it has to be broadened more systematically, of course, but it's a very good question. Thank you. Um, so if we don't have any more questions, Jeremy, would you like to conclude? Yeah, so I guess I, I sort of did uh earlier, but um, I, I think we had, you know, again, three great talks. I really appreciate Almuth, Dinesh, and Franzi taking the time to put these together for us. And I mean, almost everybody stayed to the very end. So that's a testament to uh, how interesting the content and how good the material was. Uh, next week, in, or not, next two weeks time is the last webinar of this series, and it will be on the behavioral and chemi chemical ecology of Cyrex noctilio. Hopefully, uh, we will see all of you there. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>